Welcome to the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is Hampton Newsom, whose book uh, is the recipient of the Emerging Civil War Book Award for 2022, uh, Gettysburg Southern Front. Hampton, welcome. Thank you for having me, Chris. Thanks so much. And and thanks so much about the award. I'm really honored. It's uh, fantastic news. Thank you. So you're you're our first two time winner of the award, and uh, you know your first book about the uh, the the uh, the closing months of the war in North Carolina was a hard book to top, and then you've topped it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so congratulations! Thank thank you, thanks so much. So, your new book focuses on Gettysburg and Richmond, which are probably two points in the compass most people wouldn't connect right away. Um, tell us how you saw that connection and why you decided to write about it. Well, this was this is one of those things when uh, when I was working on the book, uh, when I'd give talks, I'd often ask the audiences, you know, you know, I give talks at round tables, very knowledgeable people. Um, and I'd say, well, do, do people, does anyone know about the Blackberry radar? Does anyone know that during the Gettysburg campaign, there were 20,000 federal troops within just a few miles of Richmond, advancing on Richmond and advancing on the, uh, the, the railroads there. And occasionally there'd be a, you know, a hand that went up, um, but generally it, it's just not something many people know about. And this came to me through the veteran uh, researcher, Bryce Sudero, who uh, I've known over the years and knows a lot, and also likes to kind of throw out book ideas. And uh, and I was, after I'd finished the North Carolina thing, or I was nearing finishing it, uh, you know, I was like, Bryce, well, what, you know, what do you think would be a good topic? And he said, well, what about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the attack on Richmond during the Gettysburg campaign? And I said, what attack on Richmond during the Gettysburg campaign? I didn't know anything about it. And so I started digging in and, um, you know, this operation, sometimes it's called the Blackberry Raid, Sometimes it's called John Dix's uh, Peninsula Campaign, um, but I was really amazed at the the you know the events, the scope of what happened, and uh, just thought it would make a good book. You know, it make it makes a good narrative. Um, it has this interesting uh, connection, or you know, it's kind of part of the whole Gettysburg story. And uh, so I just kind of, kind of launched in, and and one of the nice thing, you know, I generally try to have tried to write about events that have not received a lot of attention um, through, you know, uh, long, long books or even articles. Now, there obviously there have been some articles on this thing, but one thing that's really um, satisfying is is the a lot of the research that you're turning up is just stuff that no one's really, you know, everyone knows it's out there, but no one's really used before and really, um, you know, dug into. So. It, w it was a really, I really enjoyed the project. So uh, let's give it, maybe you can give us a quick overview of what happened. Obviously don't give away the store because we want people to read the book, but sure. uh, you know, give us a, a brief sketch of the events around Richmond because most eyes are focused of course in Pennsylvania at this time. Sure, sure. So, so it all, you know, in, in early June as Lee and his army are, you know, headed up uh, toward Pennsylvania, um, you, you've got a pretty large force kind of on the peninsula in Virginia called the Department of Virginia that um, was commanded by John Dix, about 30,000 men. And as Lee is heading north, Henry Halleck, you know, who's in Washington kind of trying to coordinate things, um, he, he develops kind of this plan to go after Lee's supply lines. And this is, this is one of the parts of the project that is interesting to me because it's very rarely really talked about. Um, the Dix operation that followed is talked about, but Halleck's idea um, doesn't get a lot of play. And what Halleck did was he, he ordered Dix there in Virginia to go after Richmond um, and threaten the, the rail, threaten Richmond or threaten the railroads that are north of Richmond. We can get into some of those details. But so that was one prong. But then he asks um, John Foster down in North Carolina, who was commanding the North Carolina department down there to hit the 
um, the Wilmington Weldon Railroad, which was kind of the key supply artery up into Virginia. And then he also directed troops out in West Virginia to go after the, um, you know, the, the, the rail link out west toward Tennessee and Virginia. So there were these kind of three prongs that Halleck kind of countermeasures to what Lee uh, was looking at. And this was, um, this was kind of Halleck's idea as, you know, things were really building and it was clear that Lee was launching this major offensive. There was a lot of things going on in, uh, in Washington. Halleck had a lot of things on his plate, but this is what, um, what he came up with. And so on June 14th, he sends orders to John Dix uh, and, uh, and down in Fort Monroe to, to take, uh, basically conduct an operation against Richmond. Uh, his orders to Dix though are a little fuzzy and that causes some problems um, later on. But the, uh, the, so the, what he says is, and I, you know, I won't get into the parsing the words, but essentially he kind of says threaten Richmond and you know, go destroy those bridges that are north of Richmond. And there are two railroads that are heading north from Richmond, the Virginia Central and the, um, the RF&P. And they kind of, they go across the South Anna and the Virginia Central goes west. Well, this is kind of what Lee is relying on for a lot of things during his movement. We all know that there was a lot of foraging in Pennsylvania, but there was also a need for, um, there were troops going back and forth and, and other supplies and that kind of thing. So that is, that is what, in a nutshell, the plan was. Um, and then, you know, Dix, uh, Dix takes his troops up to Richmond. And, um, you know, it's an interesting story after that. But I'll stop there, uh, see what you want else you want to dig into. Um, so is, is Henry Halleck the right guy to coordinate all these different moving parts and all these different uh, locations? Well, it's kind of his job at the time. But it, whether he's but that the right, doesn't necessarily yeah, mean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whether whether he's the right guy, that's a really good question. And so, and you know, people have different opinions about Halleck. Um, and the, uh, you know, some think that he, you know, he did he did a pretty good job of, you know, he came from the West and he was put in Washington and he was there to kind of coordinate things. Uh, and uh, so, you know, some people thought he did a pretty good job, but the, the general criticism, I think the conventional view is that Halleck, you know, was a really smart person, um, but he had a tendency to, um, to not be able to kind of make decisions. Um, and so he would give, he would give commanders kind of vague orders, the commanders that are in the field. And so he, he wasn't really as forceful as, um, what was really needed for someone who was coordinating that. And you could see this with the Dix operation. Dix does march on Richmond. He, he sets his, um, his uh, supply base at White House Landing, which, were, which is where McClellan was the year before. It's a very convenient location uh, right there on the Pamunkey River. But Halleck, you know, he's got a lot of things going on, but he certainly does not... Um, he does not give a lot of attention to Dix during this time. And, and so, you know, you look at the, in the OR, the dispatches between say Halleck and Hooker and Lincoln, that's a whole nother thing, right? And then when Meade comes on board, you know, in, in you know, the very end of June, uh, Halleck is writing him every hour. Dix down in Richmond gets a dispatch from Halleck about every six or seven days. And they're usually kind of vague and, contradictory and that kind of thing. So I wouldn't say that Halleck really was, you know, a, a, uh, a real effective driving force in this idea. Okay. And how about Dix? He's a, a character most folks aren't familiar with. Um, I'm sure you got to become pretty familiar with him over the course of your time and your research. Um, what's your assessment of him? Well, Dix, he's kind of the quintessential political general. You know, he's a, he's a Democrat before the war. He, he, he was in his um, 60s during the war and he had very little military experience. However, he did, he was a um, youngster in the War of 1812 and was in one of the engagements there. But then he went on into this uh, career where he did lots of things, the private sector, the public sector. Um, he, was, he was a very effective public servant, um, politician, 
And right before the war, he was the, um, the Secretary of Treasury. And during the secession crisis, as things were, were um, kind of blowing up, he, he, was, uh, he sent a order to the, um, basically kind of the revenue cutters in New Orleans that were under his purview. And uh, he said, if anyone comes and tries to pull down the, the US flag there, shoot them on the spot. And the, so Dix early in the war was actually somewhat of a, a kind of a mini celebrity, I guess, because this statement was a rallying cry in the North and it was appeared in all the newspapers and they, they printed on tokens. There are these things called Dix tokens that you can see once in a while. And so he was, um, he was a very able administrator, um, but Dix was probably not the guy that you wanted at the front commanding troops if you really say wanted to take, for instance, Richmond, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the summer of 1863. Um, he, you know, he had a tendency to, to hold a lot of uh, war councils that, you know, didn't produce anything. And, uh, and he, he just wasn't, he wasn't really a hands-on tactical commander. Um, the, another interesting aspect of Dix is that he was, you know, he was a loyal Democrat. He was, he was very supportive of the war effort and he was very supportive of Lincoln, even though he disagreed with a lot of Lincoln's policies. So he was a, a very uh, important ally there in the army. And um, he was also, also consistent kind of with his political views. He, he was a, a big opponent of hard war. And that's a theme in the book that he, he, was, he, he was one of those people that believed early in the war that, oh, if we're just nice enough, some of the white Southern leaders will decide that this whole, this whole uh, civil war thing is not a good idea and they'll come back. And so he was very, um, he, he was, he was very adamant about his troops not destroying private property and not, um, you know, doing things that would hurt the kind of potential union support. Um, and so, you know, some of his officers didn't necessarily agree with him on that. And I think he was also just felt like that, that those kinds of things were the wrong thing to do. When you look at his letters to his wife, he talks about how, how upset he is when, you know, his troops do that. So, so that's John Dix. I mean, another um, thing about John Dix is in some of the photos, he has a awesome neck beard. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's not, I saw somebody, Cicely Zander, a historian had something on online the other day, there was a big discussion of, uh, of neck beards. And I, I thought of uh, John Dix. I can't remember whether the, the photo in the book um, has the, uh, has the, the neck, neck bearded Dix or not, but uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> Civil War beards are a thing. So, you know, there's someone uh, for folks to look up for sure. Yeah. I had, I had to look up neck. I was like, what is this, you know, and I had to look it up. I didn't realize it was like a thing, but I, I guess there, there are millions of different types of beards. So yeah, yeah. Learn something every day, something every day. Uh, as you were describing Dix and, and, you know, his propensity to call councils of war and not make, you know, necessarily firm decisions or have a, a good, strong vision coming out of those councils. And I tie that back to what you were saying about Halleck earlier, being a guy who's not really giving very clear, definitive, aggressive orders. And it just seems like a real recipe for um, inaction, you know, or, or an opportunity for missed opportunity, which, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately is what you write about here. Um, nobody really seems to see, though, that this is not a particularly effective combination. It's not a great combo. If if you're if you're looking for you know some kind of aggressive action at Richmond now, in Dick's defense, Richmond had a fairly large force at the time. Now, obviously, nobody really knows exactly you know at the time nobody knows exactly what's in front of them or you know that kind of thing. But um, but uh, the the uh, not to give away too much, but in terms of like the debates over that Dix has with his officers. He's got 20,000 men. He's got men from the 4th and 7th Corps. He's got about 1,000 cavalrymen. And he's, um, you know, they're, they're talking about, should we go right after 
Richmond. And this was something that they, you know, seriously considered. And, uh, you know, at the time, there, there are a lot of obstacles to that. But, um, but Dix, you know, and, and, you know, like I said, Halleck is not super involved at the time. But uh, Dix is not the kind of person who's going to make, um, you know, the, these the, you know the, these real rash decisions or, or take real risk uh, militarily. And what's interesting is at the time, and the, you know there are he does there is combat during this. There are three separate operations that um, that are um, you know that, that generate very interesting uh, engagements that you know I write about a lot in the book. Um, and we don't need to get into the tactical details of that. So there is stuff happening. But what's one other aspect of that when we're talking about Halleck is that in Washington at the time, so, so this operation occurs in late June and many, two of the big engagements happen literally during, while the fighting is happening at Gettysburg. So July um, 1st and 3rd. And uh, yeah, and at the time, the, um, the, there's a lot of debate in, in Washington. And, and with Lincoln and the cabinet about what's going on at Richmond. And you look at, you know, Gideon Wells has this wonderful diary that everyone uses um, for a lot of things and really great observations of like what's happening and, you know, who's, you know, who's scratching their cheek and, you know, whatever during all this time. And when you read it carefully, you see that there's a lot of stuff in there in late June and early July about Dix in Richmond, and there's a lot of debate about what to do. Should Dix attack Richmond? He's right out there. He's right there. Should he do it? Is Dix the right person to command this? Should we send somebody down there? And so, um, you know, the the Secretary Salmon is saying like, well, hey, let's send uh, let's send Hooker. You know, who th this is in early July, of course, and Hooker is uh, you know unemployed at the moment. And let's send him down and, you know, he'll, he'll do something down there. And then others are saying, well, maybe John Foster, you know, is a capable commander down in Newburgh. Maybe he should be sent up. Um, so this is a, you know, the, this is one of the interesting things I found with the book is that, you know, looking back, like we, you know, we've got Gettysburg gets the, all the oxygen, right? right. And, and for good reason, because it's this huge, fascinating engagement. Um, and uh, you know the big armies are there and stuff. But the the one of the interesting things about this book is looking back and putting yourself there at the time. The twenty thousand men outside of a not heavily defended Richmond was seen as a opportunity by some in Washington, and it got a lot of attention at the time. Now, I want to go back to Hooker, whom you mentioned a couple times. And uh, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about this story is that, as as you mentioned, operations get underway sort of in, in mid-June, and Halleck, who sets those operations underway, is feuding with Hooker at this time. And, you know, the the, the feud between Hooker and, ha and Halleck takes up a lot of Halleck's energy and attention and oxygen. And so that's certainly got to have a detrimental effect on what's going on elsewhere on the chessboard with Dix and Foster and, and you know, West Virginia and stuff. Um, and then to hear that, well, let's send Hooker down and take over for Dix. Like, right. who, who thinks that's a good idea after yeah. all this back and forth between Hooker and Halleck? Yeah, uh, well, there, there, you know, there are all these clicks in the administration about what should be done. But, yeah. yeah. So uh, Ulysses asked Grant, tends to get the credit for looking at grand strategy and moving all of these pieces at the same time uh, when he finally takes over in 1864. But it sounds like we've got a lot of moving pieces here that are maybe not as well coordinated or, or tended to, but it's kind of like a very embryonic version of what we'll see a year later. Yeah. Um, which I think what is one of the brilliant things about your book is you do a really neat job of bringing that all into focus as kind of a thing rather than disparate elements. Tell me about your, your kind of vision for tying all that together. Yeah. I, I mean, that's an interesting question and it kind of ties in a lot of different themes. I mean, in this case, so Halleck does have this idea, this counter blow, you know, to go after Richmond, cut the supply lines, um, and in different places, 
And so it it is a, you know, and it's not something you usually think like Halleck is is developing, you know, these things, but he he does not manage it very well, or he doesn't really pay much attention to it after he sends the orders out. He's the uh, Foster is kind of, you know, he doesn't, he had, kind of has to prod Foster along. Foster actually doesn't conduct his um, operation until a few weeks after he hears from Halleck. And the the operation in West Virginia doesn't happen until a few weeks after Gettysburg. And that's the Withbill raid, um, which is a very interesting operation I talk a little bit about in the book. So, so it's really, there's this kind of, with Halleck, with, in this particular case, there's this, there's this general idea, like we should really do something and maybe you do this and you do that. And, but it's all kind of small potatoes, right? And then it's not really pushed very well. And then, you know, you, the main thrust that you've got against Richmond is commanded by a guy who hasn't, who's really, Dix is, you know, a very able administrator. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and he, after this, he goes up to New York and is in that department and does a great job there. Um, but the, but, you know, maybe it's not really how it fits together. And you compare this to, and you mentioned Grant, and I think a good, Example is one of my favorite, like not talked about a whole lot grant issues is this thing they call the Suffolk plan. Um, and so this, I talk about this a little bit in my North Carolina book because it uh, it came up um, just as the Confederates were planning their, their kind of big campaign down in Eastern North Carolina in the spring of 1864. And there Halleck from, D from Washington, he writes Grant who's in Chattanooga and says, you know, kind of like, Hey, we're looking for ideas for the spring campaign. You know, like, like we're 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 doing a little spitball in here. What do you think? And so, so um, Grant, you know, he he talks to his staff. Baldy Smith is there, and and they um, and he comes up with this thing called the Suffolk Plan, which is well, let's just let's land sixty thousand men at Suffolk, which is you know in southeastern Virginia, and march into North Carolina and cut all the the railroads there and take Raleigh and then go down and resupply at New Bern and then take Wilmington. And all of this is said, you know, in like a very nice clean like paragraph. And it's sent to Halleck. So our friend here, who's kind of not really managing this operation in Virginia during the Gettysburg campaign six months before, but it's sent to Halleck. And this is all in January of 1864. Um, and, and Halleck sends back this really very confusing response that has one of my favorite quotes in it, which, where apparently Halleck is concerned that th this is like too piecemeal. Uh, and, and this is the guy six months before who was like, well, you cut this railroad and whatever, and you do this. And he has this quote where he says, I, I think we've been too busy cutting the toenails of our enemies. And so just rejects Grant's plan out of hand. And so the Suffolk plan kind of goes away and the, uh, you know, incursions into the into North Carolina along the railroads doesn't really happen until 1865. But I think that's an interesting comparison there between Grant. Grant had kind of this big plan. Let's do it. Halleck, you know, he's just kind of playing small ball. And you as an author also going to have to have that big vision to tie all this together in the way you have, since, you know, obviously it's been, uh, you know, a, a series of actions that have been generally overlooked because Gettysburg takes up so much oxygen. What was it like for you coming to a topic that you're learning about for the first time to kind of see that big picture horizon and pull it all together? Yeah, I, I, I really love, you know, a project like that because, like I'd said before, a lot of the stuff is new to a lot of people and it's new to me. And so I, I'm learning about John Dix. You know, I, I'm learning about some of his commanders. I, the, I'd never written much about D.H. Hill, who's the kind of the Confederate commander in Richmond at the time and does a very good job during this campaign or operation, whatever you want to call it. And so um, for me, you know, I, what I try to do with these um, projects is, you know, the, these are these are military books, they're battle books, they're campaign books, they're primarily that. But when I write them, I, I want to, for me personally, for my knowledge, and then to convey to the reader, I want to convey like, how does this fit into what's going on at the time? 
particularly the, the kind of political aspect to it. And there's a lot of that stuff in this book, including Alexander Stevens' diplomatic mission, which is a, a chunk of the book. And, um, and then, and just, just so people can see, you know, instead of these units kind of marching around on the map, like what is the bigger picture here? And also, aside from the political, what's the kind of bigger picture in terms of like, where are these, where are these units getting supplied from? What is, where are the supply lines? What, what are the, you know, these are things that, that are not always really talked about. Like where, what is the logistics, logistical trail, you know, right. of what's going on here? And so I try to pay a lot of attention to that. And then I also, I, you know, I like to look at the other things, um, for instance, in this, this book, um, it's not something I set out to look at, but uh, the involvement of enslaved people in the campaign was huge. And it would just, I, you know, I was researching, writing, and just come up over and over again that the Black people in these areas outside of Richmond, as the U.S. troops were going through, were repeatedly showing up in accounts and saying, there are Confederates over there, there's a river over here, there's a fort over here, you know, watch out for one. And then at the same time, thousands of them were freeing themselves from, you know, the, the plantations in the area and joining the Union columns and coming back to Dix's base. So, so the, all of those, so that's what, you know, when I'm looking at these things, I'm, I'm trying to see how like all of those things fit together. And just to go back to the supply issue, one thing that was really fascinating to me, and I went down a lot of rabbit holes, some of them ended up not being as deep as I wanted to be, but I was trying to understand like, what is Robert E. Lee's supply situation during the Gettysburg campaign? What is, what is, what exactly is, if anything, running back and forth between Lee's army and Richmond um, at the time? And that was very important to me in the book because the whole point of or the main point of Dix's operation was to cut these railroad bridges and somehow damage Lee's, uh, Lee's chances. Now, what, what I found was that there were, there were prisoners headed back to, from Winchester to Richmond. They were being escorted by units that they would then go back up and join. The, the kind of railheads for Lee were Culpepper and Stanton. He relied mainly on Stanton during the campaign because the the, uh, that was kind of more shielded because it's in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, but there were some, there were some units or some uh, supplies that ran through Culpeper and then went by wagon up to join Lee. And, uh, and that was kind of, that was interesting to me. And also like, so what, what impact does burning the bridges? One of the bridges does get burned. Again, not to give away everything, but like what impact does that have on Lee? And I really like dug in to, try to look at newspaper accounts from Stanton about when, when the trains were arriving and, and reports of the ordnance trains, the wagon trains that were headed up to help Lee out during the campaign. And there were several that headed up during the campaign, during the operations. And I think the bottom line there, just since we're talking about this, is that Lee was quite vulnerable during the campaign. Um, and if there had been more fighting in Pennsylvania, I think the the break in the rail line, the, the bridge, the Virginia Central Bridge across the South Anna could have affected his fortunes up there. Now, all of that is speculation and that's kind of a hard area to get into, but it was kind of fascinating to me. So when, when you're talking about like putting everything together, I, you know, I just love to geek out on it. So. Ah, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, and when you talk about being interested in the logistics, I mean, that's, the main motive for sending dicks in the first place, you know, like we're going after Lee's logistics. And so, you know, obviously you have to take a close look at that stuff because that's what's prompting the whole story to begin with. Uh, we're talking with Hampton Newsom. The book is Gettysburg Southern Front Opportunity and Failure at Richmond. And so let me, uh, published by the University of Kansas Press, which has been putting out some great stuff lately. Um, um, yeah. And just uh, let me give, that I, you know, I've really enjoyed working with Kansas and just a shout out to Joyce Harrison and Kelly Crispin Jocks, who was, um, who was the, the editor on it. Um, Joyce is kind of my patron saint in publishing because she's worked on all of my projects. She worked on my first one when she was at Kent State. 
but uh, particularly uh, John Howard, who's the copy editor. And wow. uh, I, I, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm a copy editor's nightmare. And, uh, and you know, he did a great job. And then uh, Derek Helms over there who, who does the, uh, the marketing and media stuff and, um, and fields a lot of like probably pretty annoying emails for me all the time. Yeah, well, I'm glad, uh, thanks for taking the opportunity to give them a shout out because uh, none of us as authors can do what we do if it's not for that infrastructure support that we get behind. Absolutely. Them. It is not a single person project there. It, it is Lots not. of people reading and helping and everything. So. Yeah. so let me be cynical for just a second. You, you know, we've been talking about these movements, um, you know, threatening Richmond. The title is Gettysburg's Southern Front. Um, so the cynic in me is saying like, oh, well, the Gettysburg is just in the title there because that'll sell copies. Um, but, you know, I think this ties back to this theme we've been talking about, uh, you know, about tying all this together and, and the strategy and the operational and the tactical and, and all these moving pieces on the chessboard. So when, when someone comes to your book, what do you, what do you think they're going to expect and what do they end up getting? Yeah, I, I, so the full title is, and it's on the cover, is Gettysburg Southern Front Opportunity and Failure at Richmond. Um, so there, there shouldn't be any surprises there, but the, and because most of the activity occurs at Richmond, although as we've been discussing, there's a lot in the book about the Gettysburg campaign and what's happening. Now, it's not a book on the three days of fighting there in Pennsylvania, that's for sure, but this operation is part and parcel of the entire situation that Gettysburg is, you know, because the because when Lee is headed up north, um, spending much of June uh, making his way up north, this is this is Halleck's uh, attempted reaction to it, uh, other than a direct, you know, reaction of sending the uh, the main army there. But this is this is in response to what's happening there, and if different things happen, more um, substantial success by Dix in Richmond, then this would have had a significant direct impact on what was happening in Pennsylvania at the time. So, so in, in terms of the, the, uh, the, you know, the, for the reader, I, you know, th this is, to me, it's, it's a very, it's a fascinating, um, yet fairly obscure uh, aspect of the, the Gettysburg story. And I'll take my cynics hat off and put my editor's hat on now and say that um, what I found delightful about the way the title and subtitle framed the book is um, I walked away with something new about the Gettysburg campaign. I learned something new just in general about these obscure actions that you talk about, but like, I'm always delighted to have someone help me see something. I think I know in a new way. And that's what this book does. There's, you know, which is why I just, you know, think it's so brilliant. Well, thanks. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, absolutely. So now I don't want to give away the store, but the subtitle does say opportunity and failure. Yeah. There's at not... Richmond. So there's some failure here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like, I, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone. Uh, I don't think there's a spoiler alert is needed that, you know, the, the John Dix does not capture Richmond <laughs> during the Gettysburg campaign. And uh, often when I give talks on this, that's one of the first things I say, because I, I don't, you know, you never know in the audience, you know, how knowledgeable people are, how interested they are in the Civil War. So I'm always, I, I always say, well, spoiler alert, this, you know, this doesn't, this isn't some, some uh, event that somehow you didn't know anything about that has been hiding in plain sight or whatever. But yeah, so the, the, um, so Dix does not capture Richmond, but, you know, his, his operation is par partially successful, but it also in some aspects is um, a spectacular failure, particularly the, um, they're, they're kind of three three prongs. One is a, a cavalry raid uh, on June 26th by Samuel Spear with thousand from uh, men from the 11th Pennsylvania. That is pretty successful. They, they burned the main bridge, but then the, um, and then their subsequent infantry operations, fairly large infantry expeditions um, led by uh, Erasmus Keyes, who's supposed to conduct a feint against Richmond, 
and then an even larger one, about 10,000 men marching to finish off the, uh, the bridges. And that's um, led by George Washington Getty. And the, the, uh, the, the, the extent of the, the failure and the poor decision-making is really breathtaking and, and makes you know, for kind of an interesting story in itself um, during those operations. So um, as you kind of tie all this together, I mean, and let me actually, let me backtrack a second because you talked about D.H. Hill. I don't want to let him yeah. escape for a second because um, he's a fascinating guy to me. Um, what I think is really neat context is before Lee launches the Gettysburg campaign, you know, they're talking about taking a couple of divisions from him, sending them out to Vicksburg, and he's looking for excuses to keep his guys, and he needs to be reinforced, or he's going to have to fall into Richmond's defenses, and he's asking D.H. Hill for reinforcements from North Carolina, and Hill's like, no, and if you read the correspondence between the two of them, um, Hill's really snippy, because I think he's still carrying that grudge from being banished from Lee's army, so there's this real weird tension between Lee and Hill Lee then moves forward northward into Pennsylvania and Hill's the guy that's left to kind of cover his backside, um, which is a really interesting position for Hill to find himself in. Um, what do you make of Hill being put in that kind of situation uh, at this moment of crisis? I, I think he was the, you know, he, he was the, the best of the, of the second choices or whatever. I, I, and I, and I have to say that D.H. Hill managed the troops at Richmond during this operation um, really well. He had interior lines. They had these railroads. So, so he's getting threats directly east of Richmond along the Chickahominy. He's getting threats to the railroad, the key railroad bridges to the north. And he's got three veteran degree brigades with him, essentially are, um, Jenkins, Cook, and Ransom. And then he's got kind of the normal Richmond defenses. He's got over over ten thousand, maybe about thirteen thousand, actually. Um, although you know the core uh, quality is in those three brigades, and he shuttles them around. So uh, you know it's hard to criticize his performance there. What is interesting to me, in particular, about D. H. Hill is that. Um, that he just seems to have horrible sandbox skills, you know? <laughs> and, you know, he just, you know, he's he's a really, seems to be a really bright guy. Now this is, I, I like I said, I haven't like written on other campaigns that he's been involved in other than he was briefly involved in North Carolina in 1863. Um, but yeah, a very smart guy, very aggressive. You know, he, you, the things that the, the movements he, he takes reminds you at, outside of Richmond at the time, kind of reminds you of Lee and Jackson. You know, just yeah. go out, hit him hard, um, and uh, and just and he and he seems to kind of read Dix's mind, like what's happening here. But he does, as you said, like when, when in the run up to the the uh, you know the offensive up up north, there is this squabbling about what what troops are going to stay in Richmond, what, which ones are going with Lee, and D.H. Hill is not very politic at all, and he has kind of the tact of a locomotive, you know, and he, he and at one point, um, as you said, with this exchange, he, he writes Lee, and Lee kind of throws up his hands and just tells Jefferson Davis, look, like, you know, I'm not, I can't deal with this, essentially, you know, you solve it, and then things kind of simmer down, and they figure out who's going where. And so there, there is, you know, Montgomery Course's brigade for a time is also up around Hanover Junction, but he's edging more and more north as Lee wants him up there. There, there is one regiment um, from Pettigrew's brigade, um, of the 44th North Carolina, which is involved in that bridge fight during the cavalry raid at the, um, at the South Anna. And that's a very, that's a very interesting story uh, there that's in in the book that this is a this is a very sharp engagement there and uh and the the hundred north carolinians against a thousand uh cavalrymen um and it, it's uh uh for the bridge and and uh that was a very interesting thing but back to hill i i think that um you know i one of the things that was interesting that i wrote a book on the 
part of the Petersburg campaign in October. And I remember going through the OR and I'm going through and you know, you're kind of organizing, okay, this is that and this is this. And, and it's all about Petersburg and what's happening there at the time. And then there's like this 40 page chunk of the OR that are letters back and forth from Lee, from other people in Richmond, trying to basically saying, DH Hills in North Carolina doing nothing. And we really should find something for him to do. And it just goes on. And I'm just like, well, okay, when are we getting back to Petersburg? And it goes on and on. And it's clear that people are like, <laughs> you know, yeah, he might be good, but I, I'm not really interested. Um, that was kind of the first time I'd stumbled across the uh, DHL stuff. So, um, you know. I'm, He's I mean, an exceptional division commander, but like you said, he doesn't get along with anybody, which is why Lee sends him away. And uh, I think it's interesting, you know, he does such a, a good job there in Richmond. He's rewarded by being sent west to yeah. join Braxton Bragg. Down to that people, mess. Yeah, I know. <laughs> most people don't think of that as a reward, but like they need a, a, an experienced corps commander out there. So he gets shifted out there as someone with some experience and, of course, just makes that even worse out there. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, just uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah, he does have my, one of my favorite quotes from this book, which is um, when the when Keyes does that that faint. Um, D.H. Hill, who's writing with Davis throughout this whole thing, because, you know, Davis is always getting down in the weeds. And the, during this campaign, he would, I think Davis was ready to go out to the front line and tell people where to dig, you know, or whatever. But, um, but he, Hill says, I think it was, it was not a, a faint, it was a faint. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway. <laughs> So I want to give you a, a second just to talk about your book about the fight for the old North state. But before we shift gears, um, anything I haven't asked you about Gettysburg's Southern front that, uh, that you want to mention? I think we've covered a lot. I mean, the, one of the things when you give talks about a 300 page book, you're always leaving stuff out and that, you know, there, there's there for me, you know, there are lots of really interesting angles. Um, the, the, uh, Alexander Stevens, you know, the, during this time, Alexander Stevens comes up to Richmond because he has this idea for a peace mission. And uh, so he tries to get to Washington during, while the fighting's going on at Gettysburg. And all the while he's kind of arguing with Jefferson Davis. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, the, 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 the goals of the mission are very murky. But it's pretty clear when you read between the lines that they were looking to Davis and Stevens were looking to negotiate some sort of peace. It all falls apart, of course, when Stevens is kind of waiting on his little boat outside Fort Monroe to head up to Washington on July 3rd and then the 4th. And they're seriously debating this in the cabinet with Lincoln. Well, maybe we should let him come up and we'll talk to him. And then the news comes in from Gettysburg. And they say, see you later. But then there's all this speculation after what, like what was, was Stevens going to do? And, and there was a very interesting column in the New York Herald that, that, uh, that suggests that had good authority, was from Southern sources, that Stevens was going to threaten to arm the enslaved people in the South. And I thought this was a, you know, I don't, it's probably not credible. Um, Although the, the person who wrote it had was very well connected to Richmond. He's actually the person who wrote the poem Stonewall Jackson's Way. And, um, but I thought it was fascinating because it was a fairly detailed discussion of this issue. And this is, you know, months before Cleburne raises it. Now, this issue had been uh, the, the issue of arming slaves in the South by the Confederacy had been something that would, you know, you kind of see references here and there, but this was like a big thing to it. So there are all these, you know, there are a lot of other things, but, you know, that, that that's the, the Stevens thing is one little aspect of it that I just thought was interesting. It happened at the same time. And as all these military events were happening in Richmond, there was also this debate about this peace mission and whether it should happen. Um, so so uh, Gettysburg Southern Front is the recipient of this year's Emerging Civil War book award and it proves that lightning strikes twice because you are a previous recipient 
of the award for your earlier book, The Fight for the Old North State. And I want to give you the opportunity to talk about that just a little bit, because again, another great book. If folks miss that or it's on their list of, of books they want to get around to, and I've just been meaning to, here's your great excuse to uh, to go read that book. It's fantastic. Tell us a little bit about it, Hampton. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So the, the Fight for the Old North State um, essentially covers the kind of late war Confederate uh, uh, campaign in eastern North Carolina in 1864 that resulted in the capture of Plymouth down there. Um, so it, it covers, it spans several months. Again, you know, this is a whole picture kind of approach. Uh, the uh, in early January, Robert E. Lee is, you know, he's really concerned about supply and he, um, for his army. And most of Eastern North Carolina at the time is uh, controlled by uh, Union forces and they have various outposts uh, and bases, New Bern, Plymouth, Washington, Roanoke Island. And so Lee's idea is to send a task force down there and um, capture some or all of these positions back and open up those areas so that the um, so that more supplies can get to his army, and in in making this recommendation, he also is concerned about the political situation in North Carolina at the time. There, through 1863 into 1864, there's this growing peace movement in North Carolina. It's kind of loosely organized uh, and loosely led by William Holden, who was a um, a newspaper editor down there. And the goals of it were kind of vague, but the basic idea was that the people advocating for peace, they, they wanted to pull North Carolina out of the war. They, they were, these were not abolitionists or anything. A lot of them, their main concern was that if the war kept going the way it was gonna go, then slavery would be abolished. And, and the point of, you know, for them, the point of the war uh, you know, would be a failure. And so they were looking for some way around this. Now, this was clearly an existential crisis for Confederate North Carolina and also for the Confederacy as a whole. And people in Richmond, Davis, Lee, they all understood this. And so one of the reasons for having this campaign in Eastern North Carolina was to, to you know, kind of boost morale, boost Confederate support in North Carolina. And so he sends down this, this force um, led by George Pickett, and uh, young General uh, Robert Hoke is involved too. And there are many events, we won't get into the details, but very interesting attack on New Bern called the New Bern Expedition or whatever you wanna call it with some very interesting military uh, events there, including the cutting out expedition of the biggest Union gunboat there and, and uh, a, a near uh, event where Hoke almost captures a train and puts his troops on there to ride right into New Bern and take New Bern, which is kind of the big base there in North Carolina. But that's a failure. Then there's this episode after that where uh, North Carol white North Carolinians who were in Union units were captured at New Bern. Some of them were found to have uh, served in Confederate units and many of them were executed in an event called the Kenson Hangings that many people may have heard of. Uh, and uh, this was, kind of George Pickett's doing, uh, lots of uh, ramifications there, uh, interesting issue. Um, then you've got the gubernatorial election, all that uh, with uh, Holden, that newspaper editor was talking about, runs against Zebulon Vance, an interesting character uh, down there. And But the Confederates continue their efforts. And in April, with the help of these homegrown ironclads, particularly the Albemarle, Hoke marches on Plymouth uh, and attacks Plymouth and takes Plymouth. And this is a fairly significant Confederate victory at the time. This is April, 1864, where there are not a lot of Confederate victories across the map. Uh, and so it's just, for, for me, look, working on the project is really interesting. My, my family's from Eastern North Carolina. It was a joy to kind of dig up stuff about you know, all the events that happened out there and try to fit it into the, the, these very interesting military operations into the broader context of what was happening in the war at the time. Uh, yeah, and you know when you talk about you know Lee looking for supplies, one of the most striking bits of correspondence he writes during that time is a letter to his wife asking her and her friends to knit socks yes. for his men. You yeah. know, like 
things are desperate if the army commander is telling his wife knit socks for my guys. So, you know, that, that provides some context for just how important these actions. In yeah, work absolutely. With. And, and there's another great, um, uh, letter from him to somebody in the, uh, I don't know where some, some supply officer and, uh, and Lee is instructing him on the best way to make shoes, like the facing of the leather or something that I was just thinking, um, this is either either Lee has a lot of time on his hands, which I doubt, or this is something he cares about that he sees as a real crisis. Wow, wow. Hampton, I've uh, really appreciated the chance to talk with you today. Um, this has been a lot of fun. The book is fantastic. It's called Gettysburg Southern Front. Congratulations on a great book. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Oh, it's a delight. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for being with us today on the Emerging Civil War podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.